been around for several years, has developed a strong brand, and has seen consistent year-over-year -year growth since it was founded. Now, as is the case with most leaders, you're not quite satisfied. You have a feeling that a new product or strategy could significantly increase your growth trajectory. But there's a catch. This new idea of yours could potentially conflict with your existing business model. So how do you proceed? What do you do? Or at the Lean Startup Conference, do you just build a minimally viable product? And implement a build, measure, and learn feedback loop and call it a day? Well, these were some of the same questions that we were asking at Kiva two years ago. Kiva, for those of you who don't know, is a small little nonprofit here in San Francisco whose mission is to connect people through micro lending to alleviate poverty. Two years ago, we'd been around for six years. We'd been featured on shows like Oprah, Frontline, and publications like Times and Forbes. And our lender base had made over $200 million in loans to over 750,000 entrepreneurs in about 60 countries. While we were humbled by these accomplishments, we were also acutely aware of the fact over 2 billion people in the world live on less than two and a half dollars a day. And so if we aspire, we aspire to live to the wide-reaching aspirations of our founders when they started Kiva, it was clear that more should and would have to be done. Now, around this time, fortuitously, two trends began to take hold. One was mobile payments. In places like Kenya, 17 million people, close to 70% of the adult population, had access to M-Pesa, a mobile payment transfer service that allowed users to send money to other users, deposit and withdraw cash, and also pay bills amongst other things. The second trend was peer-to-peer -peer crowdfunding. In places like the US, sites like Kickstarter were adding over a million new funders every month. Right, this was an increase from 100,000 just a year before. Over 10x. So given the changing landscape, the fact that we felt it was our responsibility to hit as many of these 2 billion people as possible, our leadership team, they formed a little hypothesis about a model, a more direct model that would allow us to reach borrowers with lower cost. Now, to understand the implications of this and what this meant, I think it's important to understand how Kiva's existing model works today. The model that you would see and feel if you went to our website. This model has four main actors. There are the lenders. There's Kiva. There's Kiva's partners, these are like banks, microfinance institutions. And then there are entrepreneurs like Patrick who we're ultimately trying to serve. Right now, Patrick's MFI posts Patrick's story, his picture, the purpose of his loan, and the loan amount to Kiva's website. And then lenders from all over the world log in and contribute as little as $25 to Patrick's handicrafts business. Now, if this loan is funded, Kiva then sends the money to the MFI on Patrick's behalf. Patrick doesn't directly receive the cash. When it's time to repay, Patrick then pays the MFI, both the principal of the loan, as well as a little bit of interest. This can be as high as 20 to 35%. Now, I know that sounds like a lot, but when you consider the alternatives available to Patrick, you could go to money lender in his village and charge him 80, 90% interest. You consider the great wraparound services that a lot of MFIs provide, it's not all that unreasonable. The MFI then sends Kiva and in turn our lenders the principal of the loan. So while the loan is 0% interest for our lenders, and the MFI certainly benefits, it's not exactly cheap for Patrick. But with the advent of mobile 
full payment technology and crowdfunding, we want to see if we could change this. So in terms of reaching Patrick, we wondered if it would be possible to work with individuals and organizations in Patrick's village that actually knew him as a person, not just a PNL. In terms of sending money to Patrick, we wondered if we could use his mobile phone and send money directly to him. This way, all Patrick would be responsible for are the transaction fees related to withdrawing the cash and then sending us free payments. Of course, the added benefit of this model is that now Patrick, for the first time, can actually connect directly with his lenders. That was the vision, a more direct model. Of course, you guys in the audience are probably saying, well, there's a, there's a problem with this model, right? completely circumvents the MFI. Right? These are the partners that have helped us get to 750,000 entrepreneurs in the first place, right? And 40% of Kiva's staff was employed directly to support these guys. So you can't possibly just build something, can you? <coughs> the first of four challenges that you have to address when you're trying to start something within an existing organization figure out a way to get existing stakeholders on board. Now, for the purpose of this conversation, I'll focus on internal stakeholders, but I think the same principles apply to external stakeholders as well. In our case, it was the trustees. So the first step you have to do in an existing organization, and this is in contrast, I think, to a startup where I think the product and service in and of itself is unifying. So you have to outline a vision. Now this sounds pretty obvious, but it's admittedly something we did not do at Kiva until two months after we'd already started testing this model. Now it can be as simple as carving out an hour in an all hands meeting, but the goal should be threefold. Number one, you should use this time to explain how the new vision fits in with the existing model. Matt, our CEO and Kevin, our president, they did a fantastic job of anchoring around the idea of our mission statement. There are literally countless ways that you can connect people through micro-lending to alleviate poverty. Working with MFIs is one great way, but that shouldn't preclude us from trying other things as well. The second goal should be to give people a forum where they can voice their opinions. Not everyone's going to agree, but it certainly was the case for us. People are going to have questions, but these questions are valid and deserve to be surfaced. And the th third and final goal should be to set expectations. So Matt and Cuddle did a great job making it abundantly clear that this new pilot project that we were testing called Kiva Zip was a pilot. Right? We're testing in two geographies, the US and Kenya, and it could very much, very well fail. And if that happens, that's okay. In fact, we should embrace that. Once you've outlined a vision, the next step is to create a separate cross-functional team. We accidentally did this first. Uh, but our original team had four and a half members, had two business leads, one product manager, and one and a half engineer. That's all we could really steal from, from Kiva. But the benefit of creating a separate cross-functional team for me was fourfold. So number one, it allowed us to get out of everyone's way. Right? If you're trying to convince people, colleagues, to get on board with an idea, the last thing you want to do is step on their toes. The second benefit is that it allowed us to move quickly. We had a self-sufficient team. So we were able to build a website, test fund flows across M-Pesa and PayPal here in the US, set up bank accounts, and we were actually able to onboard our first group of trustee partners and borrowers all within three months. If you're trying to get someone on board, you need to give them something to react to. The third benefit is that it allowed us to focus. In fact, it forced us to focus. We didn't have resources to try a bunch of different things. We had a website, one technology pathway, two payment mechanisms, as I said, and Pesa and PayPal. And the fact of the matter is, we only had one product. We were doing business loans. We were doing micro insurance, micro savings, student loans, just business loans. More important than giving someone something to react to is giving them something specific and concrete to react to. 
And of course, the fourth and final benefit, I think, for us was that it allowed us to pivot very quickly. I remember when I was in Kenya onboarding our first group of borrower, trustees and borrowers, I must have gone through, gosh, probably six, seven dozen trustees before I finally arrived at our first five partners. Right, so if you're gonna try to convince someone to get on board quickly, you can't afford to let your, your mistakes linger. And I think that's a big benefit of creating a separate team. The third thing you have to do, you have to build a separate, simple sandbox. How's that for alliteration? A separate, simple sandbox, right? If only you create a space where you can play and learn. In our case, we created a separate website called zip.kiva.org. Um, you guys should definitely check it out um, at some point. You can even make a loan if you guys get a chance. But for us, the separate website did four things. Again, it allowed us to get a look out of the way. Right? We created a separate technology stack. We didn't bother any of our existing engineers on Kiva. Two, allowed us to protect our brand. We created this website and we slapped alpha all over it, not even beta. Alpha, right? When we knew we made a mistake and we failed, no harm, no foul. The third benefit was it allowed us to test and learn a bunch of things that we could have done if we were tethered to Kiva's website. Right? So on Kiva, I mentioned that as a lender, you have to make a minimum contribution of $25 to a borrower. On Zip, we've been able to play around with $5 loan shares. And hey, if this works, this is something that can contribute to the larger brand. I think the fourth and final benefit for, for us in terms of creating a sandbox is that it provided really clear feedback loop for us and folks on, at the company, right? If we had done direct loans on Cuba's website, we are doing about 20, 30 a month. There is no way we would have been able to figure out if we were doing well or not. Kiva does thousands of loans per month, and Kiva has a 99% repayment rate. So if 30 loans were struggling, it wouldn't have moved the needle. But when you put repayment rate front and center on a separate website, and your, your loans are tanking, it's pretty obvious. Fourth and final thing we did is we tried to engage staff on a regular basis. So my, my colleague Johnny and I, we actually set up regular open invite meetings for all of our staff to attend on a monthly basis. The goal of this for us was twofold. So number one, we, we weren't microfinance experts by any means. And so we wanted to see if we could leverage our existing knowledge base within, Ken, within Kiva, right? We could use all the help we could get. The second benefit is that it allowed us to provide a very regular update to staff members. And ultimately what we found out is that people stopped coming to these meetings. Now it could be because Johnny and I are very charismatic, I don't know. But I hope that part of the reason is that folks got very comfortable with the idea of testing something new. Of course, just because you get people on board doesn't mean you're done. Far from it. If you can't figure out how to define and measure success, people are going to jump off the bandwagon very quickly. At a for-profit company, this is pretty easy, right? You test a new product or you have a new product idea that you have. You use things like gross margin. A nonprofit is a little bit more difficult. One of the biggest problems is that you have so many stakeholders, both internal and external, all of whom want, all of whom want different things. Some people care about breadth of impact. How many people are you serving? Some people care about depth of impact. Furthermore, even when you find common ground, you don't even know where to start. I suppose we were focused on depth of impact on Kiva's <coughs> Do we measure employment opportunities created? Do we measure income generated? Number of kids sent to school? Where do you even begin? It's difficult. I think one of the best things you can do, right, to measure success effectively is start by identifying three to five very simple goals and metrics. 
No more. The fewer metrics that you abide by, the easier it will be for you to track progress. In our case, on Zip, we came up with five high-level goals and metrics. These goals and metrics were external, external in the sense that we we're reporting them to, to staff members, the leadership team, and to board members. The first goal was around raising enough money to fund these loans. After all, it'd be kind of sucky if we posted a bunch of borrowers to our website, they just expired, no one funded them, and then we had to go back to them and say, sorry, couldn't give you any money. So to measure this, we actually anchored around loan capital. Pretty self-explanatory. The second goal was to make sure that we were building a platform that's actually gaining traction and growing. We could have done this in two ways, I think. We could have anchored around a number of borrowers or a number of loans. We decided to choose the latter, if only because we thought it was a truer measure of our operational efficiency. After all, it's not a bad thing if a borrower is taking out repeat loans and growing their business. The third goal was to actually create a platform that was sustainable. One of the only ways that this platform could be sustainable, right, is if lenders were getting their money back so that they could actually take that money and recycle it and help someone else. To measure this, we use repayment rate. Now, Kiva's repayment rate, as I mentioned, is 99%. Uh, we knew we were doing something for the first time, and it was much riskier, so we anchored around a target of 85% across both geographies. In retrospect, we could have probably just stopped here. And we were doing a pilot for the first time, and frankly, at the end of the day, there are only really three fundamental questions that we had to answer for ourselves. Are we raising enough money to fund these loans? Are we posting more loans to the website and are our lenders getting paid back? If even one of those things wasn't happening, right, we were, we were in trouble. Nonetheless, we decided to take a couple of other uh, goals and metrics, one around connection. So we wanted to see if the, the connection between borrowers and lenders was actually meaningful. We decided to choose a number of comments to measure that. And then impact, after all, that's why we work at Kiva, right? We wanted to make sure these loans are improving the lives of our borrowers. And we chose net promoter score to measure that. I'll get to why in a minute. Because the second thing that I want to emphasize for you guys when it comes to measuring success is that when you are selecting your primary and secondary goals and metrics, right? It's okay and even preferred if those metrics are directional in nature. To give you a couple of examples, let me pick one external metric, net promoter score, which I talked about, and then one internal metric. This was a metric we were just circulating amongst ourselves on the team, cycle time. So let's start with net promoter score. Net promoter score, NPS. Sounds kind of dirty to use NPS, right? A metric that a lot of for-profit companies use, like Google and Microsoft and Apple, use to assess their brand awareness, to assess whether or not a loan is making a difference for a, in the life of a farmer in Kenya. Right? Sounds weird. Especially when you consider the fact that there are a lot of other metrics that we could have used. Again, like employment opportunities created, income generated, number of kids sent to school, the progress out of poverty index, PPI. The fact of the matter is when you're starting something for the first time, you can't possibly know what metric to choose. Right? You don't know what the right metric is. It's more important that you know that you're moving in the right direction. Is NPS our ultimate measure of, of impact? Probably not. Right? But if that farmer in Kenya is willing to highly recommend Zip to their friends and family, they must be doing something right. In terms of internal metrics, I mentioned cycle time, which in our case, in the 
for the purpose of this presentation was really the amount of time it took to post the first loan from a newly onboarded trustee. Last year, it took us over two months to do this. If you look at the value chain, the details of which are not exactly important, it's pretty clear to understand why. Everything we were doing was very, very manual. We were going out to the field to visit each one of our trustee partners to do due diligence and training with them. Even if you're in Nairobi, that can take as much as half a day when you consider traffic. A lot of our borrowers couldn't even fill out an application on the website. And so our trustees were mailing us paper applications. But guess who had to do the data entry? Right? Took a while. And even when the data was where it needed to be, we found that there were a lot of issues with the loan application, so we'd have to follow up with our trustees and borrowers via SMS, via phone, via email. These are busy guys, right? These are busy people. It took sometimes two weeks for us to get a resolution. So suffice to say, there are a lot of issues. Now, our cycle time is around 30 days. Thanks in large part to a lot of the product and business solutions we've either implemented or are in the process of implementing. Now, are these the optimal solutions? No. Are we, are we satisfied with a 30-day cycle time? Absolutely not. But the point is that we're continuing to improve. We're seeing directional progress. Does that make sense? Um, now the challenge, of course, is that even when you have an intuition for how to measure success, right, the problem is that oftentimes, particularly in a nonprofit, it takes months and even years for you to get a feedback loop, to see results. So how do you mitigate against this? That, for me, is the third challenge that we have to address. <coughs> One of my favorite borrowers, Michael, exemplifies this. Side note, Michael is actually the first person we actually sent money to via M-Pesa. I was so excited uh, when his loan funded that I completely lost track of the time zone difference between here and Kenya. I accidentally sent him money at 3 a.m. I don't think he was too bothered by that. Funny story, and really cool guy. So consider for a moment a world where we hadn't decided to use NPS to measure the impact of our loans on Michael's life. Instead, we'd use something like number of kids in Michael's family attending school regularly. Well, two years ago, a couple of weeks before we actually launched it, Michael's restaurant burned to the ground because it was the only source of income for his family, he dumped all of his life savings into resurrecting the business. Unfortunately, he's a little bit short, that's where Kiva Zip came into the picture. He took out a $350 zero percent interest loan to buy CapEx, things like cook stoves and cutlery. But you, as you can imagine, it took months, almost a year, before he was able to turn things around took an additional 12 months for him to get to the point where he no longer had to reinvest his profit into his business. And he could actually save some of that money to send his kids to school. So it took 24 months for him to actually get to the point where his, school, his kids were being educated. It's a long time. So to ensure that your feedback loop is as short as possible, I think the first and most critical step is to get out to the field. And I know that this is a lean startup conference, you guys have heard this ad nauseum, you're probably tired of it. But this is really critical, I think, to emphasize. At Kiva, we're fortunate enough to be able to leverage uh, the Kiva Fellows Program. This program sends out about 100 volunteers out into the field on Kiva's behalf to work with our partners and our borrowers. In fact, in the last 12 months, we've had about 40 
fellows working on Zip alone. The fact of the matter is we would not have been able to acquire learnings as quickly or efficiently as we have been, right? Had we not leveraged this program. It's hard to kind of impact Kenya when you're sitting in an ivory tower here in San Francisco. The second step is to run small and discreet experiments. You don't need a sample size of 200 to get robust directional feedback. Case in point, one of my favorite experiments on ZIP was one that we ran around borrower trustees. So in an effort to build a viral, low-cost model, we kind of wondered, hey, is it possible for borrowers to endorse other borrowers for a loan? To get an intuition for this, we needed to understand three things, right? Number one, would these borrowers actually need an incentive to endorse another borrower? Two, who would they even endorse in the first place? And three, would their borrowers even repay their loan? So to understand this, we picked 40 of our best borrowers. And we divided them into two groups. One group, we gave them a full menu of non-monetary and monetary rewards, and the other one, we said, you're not getting anything. To our surprise, 19 out of 19 borrowers that did not receive a reward, they enthusiastically signed up to become trustees themselves. In fact, they were saying things like, hey, people from all over the world have helped me improve my life. It's my duty to pay that forward. Then we gave everyone, all 40 of these borrowers, the opportunity to endorse whoever they wanted. It was open hunting season. We fully expected that borrowers would endorse their husbands and their wives, right? Obviously, they would benefit from the loan if they did that. To our surprise, only one person endorsed a relative. And even that was a distant relative who didn't even live in the same household. Most everyone endorsed business associates and friends, people they had known for years and trusted with their lives. So it should come as no surprise then that when we followed up on the repayment rate of these borrowers, it was 93%. And we learned this all with 40 people in 10 weeks. Not bad. The final step is to iterate and pivot quickly. An example on Kiva Zip Kenya is an experiment that we ran a few months ago around trustee references. So if you guys recall, last year our cycle time was very long, it was about 60 days. A big reason for that was that it was taking us so much time to do trustee due diligence. And to go out to the field to visit these guys' offices, right? And a lot of them don't even live in around Nairobi where we're headquartered. I shouldn't say headquartered, but we're based, right? And so imagine how much it took to actually go out to remote villages in Western Kenya, for instance. It was challenging. So I thought it would be game changing. I thought it would be brilliant if during the application process, every trustee provided us with the names of three to five references who we can then follow up with remotely. I thought it was the best idea ever. I gave it away a little bit ago, but what do you guys think happened? Failed. We didn't see any kind of discrepancy in the data that we were getting. Every trustee reference was had glowing reviews for the trustee applicants. One trustee even uh, directed us to his mother. I, I hope she had good things to say about him. Right? As a consequence, as a consequence, it wasn't really a good predictor of behavior. So many trustees that have passed through that experiment have actually had a really low repayment rate. So it failed, right? I don't think so. In 12 weeks, we were able to disprove my cockamamie idea, and we didn't waste a single man engineering man hour on building it. 
I'd say that's a pretty good thing. Now, of course, deriving validated learnings quickly and efficiently is extremely valuable. Right? But it's only valuable if you can actually implement those learnings. How do you do that in a world where you have limited resources? That's the fourth and final challenge that I want to discuss with you guys today. I think the first step is to manage throughput. So on the Kenya side, we run about 30 experiments in the last 12 months. But because of limited engineering resources and competing interests, we had a very hard time implementing those and turning them into product solutions. In fact, we still have learnings from November that are just kind of sitting there and collecting dust. So to prevent this from happening again, we've done three things. Number one, we're leveraging project management tools like Jira and Asana to create our own very, very simple Kanban board. Kanban is something I think you guys are pretty familiar with. Our Kanban board is very, very simple. It has four columns. We have an ice box. We list for all of our pie in the sky ideas, our crazy ideas that we might not ever come back to. We have an ideas and discussion column. This is where we flesh out concepts and we design experiments for text. Our next in line column, these are the ideas that we've already validated and we want to spec out. And then the fourth and final column is the active column. This is where we're actually building things. The second thing we've done is we've actually moved forward things on a just-in-time basis. We're trying to get better at that. Right? A Kanban board should resemble a funnel, and the bottom of it should be super, super narrow. We only have two or three items in our active column, and only ever two or three more in the next in line column. And we don't move anything from one column to the other until something has been built found that's been pretty helpful. And the third and final thing that we're in the process of doing is we're trying to develop metrics that help us assess whether or not our product changes are actually effective. One thing I recommend here is to tie those metrics to your external metrics, right? What's the point of building something if it doesn't increase your NPS, increase the number of loans posted, Increase your repayment rate or decrease your cycle time, right? For instance, there's no point in building. The second step, I think, is to automate as much of the flow as you possibly can. Now, I think, you know, we're in San Francisco, we're all techies to a certain degree. I think the inclination is to automate as much as we possibly can. I argue that you only want to automate the things that directly provide value to your customer as quickly and efficiently as possible. In our case, creating value, be it for our borrowers, our trustees, or our lenders, was synonymous for, with posting loans to the website and sending borrowed money. Everything else is either irrelevant or an intermediate but necessary step. Things like trustee training, borrower due diligence, right? Those sorts of things. Automate the necessary but intermediate steps. <coughs> Certain things provide intangible value. I would say those things are okay to do manually. Right? I still get up every morning, I try to, at 9 a.m. and do customer service answer queries from borrowers and trustees. In Kenya, we still have coffee meetups and an advisory committee meeting with our best trustees. We want to ensure that we're building a model that everyone can be proud of. Here in the US, actually, last Friday, we had a holiday party for all of our borrowers in the Bay Area so that they can meet one another and share their goods with the Kiva community. Are those things Low cost, low touch, no. But 
I'd argue that in some cases, human touch was not intended for the masses. So let's recap. You're the leader of an organization, and you have a hunch that a new product or strategy could significantly alter your growth trajectory. But it competes with your existing business model. There are undoubtedly going to be challenges that you have to overcome along the way. You're going to see pushback from internal staff members. Right? You're going to have to figure out how to develop success metrics with an uncertain future and different stakeholders that are competing for attention. You're going to have to figure out how to get around a long feedback loop and also deal with limited resources. But if you want more people in the right way, if you emphasize simple and directional data, <coughs> test and iterate quickly, and you pull forward learnings as they are needed, just in time, and you automate the right things, you can succeed. And let me just leave you with this. It's not going to be easy. You're undoubtedly going to make mistakes like us. Right? We, we made so many mistakes along the way. But you have to try. The work that you're doing in this room, the expanding access to education, streamlining health care, or alleviating poverty, is too important, it is too critical for you not to choose the riskiest, most challenging, and ultimately, most profound path. Regardless of what sector you're in, what you do, I guarantee you there's someone out there that desperately needs your product or service. If you're in education, there's a kid, a 19-year-old kid here in San Francisco, who dropped out of college because his high school didn't give him the confidence or the skill set he needed to pursue higher education. If you're in healthcare, I bet you there's a single mom in New York who can't afford to pay for her child's prescription because understandably, she lost track of how much money was in her health savings account. And if you're like us, you're in development, there's someone out there like Johannes. Johannes is an Ethiopian re refugee who escaped to Kenya after coming over, overcoming so many different hardships, only to be treated as a second-class citizen in his new home. There's no way he would have been able to access financing, increase his income, or even get more than one meal a day because of his social status. But we reached him. So can you. Thank you. So we got a few minutes for questions. Sure. Can you just um, repeat the question also? Sure. So um, the question was whether or not we um, intend to use NPS as our proxy for impact going forward. Um, I think the answer, honestly, is TBD. Um, I think as we start to get better at um, uh, identifying data that we can capture from our borrowers accurately, right, and actionably, uh, we'll start to add to our suite of metrics. Um, but for now, I think the idea is to just make sure that we're moving in the right direction. And NPS seems to be a nice little proxy for that. Uh, so, so you mentioned that you know, uh, some of the points you have in your was how to uh, create this out of Kiva. Right. But how are you, what's the plan to merge it back into Kiva? So the question was, uh, I guess you have my case, the question was, um, so we have a plan, we had a plan for how to create Zip outside of Kiva, but 
what are we going to do to integrate the two platforms? Um, I think it's frankly a little bit uh, too far out to know uh, for sure. I think the intention is very much to integrate the two platforms, um, but right now we're still very much, as I said, in alpha beta mode, right? So the idea is we want to make sure that we have something that can work, that can grow to other geographies before we start to uh, bake things back into Kiva. Does that make sense? Right, yeah, I was trying to get to the cannibalization of your existing business kind of scenario. Is that where you're headed, right? So I think, I think that's a really fair point. I think, you know, our hope is that there's a genuine kind of options framework in the marketplace. I, I definitely think that there's merit to a microfinance model. A lot of borrowers actually prefer that. You know, if you're on Kiva Zip, you have to post your picture to the website for everyone to see. Borrowers don't like that. You also have to associate yourselves in some ways with poverty. A lot of borrowers don't like that association either. So my hope is that there are genuine pros and cons to everything that we do. And that one day, perhaps, Akiva will have a microfinance arm, right? But we'll also have this direct channel. And one thing you have to consider is our lenders as well, right? So this direct channel is far riskier than the microfinance model. If you're a lender on Kiva, you get your money 99% of the time back if you make a loan to borrow to an MFI. Not such a sure bet with Zip. So as you've been building this internal startup, um, what is the most effective team size and mixture? Great question. Um, so right now, uh, gosh, we probably have, I want to say, six or seven full-time folks and then a bunch of volunteers. Um, I'd say any more than that is very difficult to manage. I mean, we're already kind of hitting up against it ourselves. Um, I think particularly because we're trying to pilot this program in two very different geographies, right? It's much easier, I think, to manage a larger team if you have kind of one geography target audience that you're going after. We, we, we now have to figure out a way to reconcile those two, right? So I'd advocate if you're gonna do something like that, keep it small. Sorry, what was it? How do you? Like, how do you norm them? Like, and getting them to stay where they can work together effectively? Yeah, gosh, that's a tough question. Um, I think, kind of, uh, on our end, um, you know, when we first started, um, we, we essentially anchored around the philosophy that, you know, I'm sure you guys have heard this in San Francisco. You need a builder, <coughs> you need a hacker, a hustler, and a, right, and a designer. Um, and so that's kind of the framework that we implemented to start. Um, I think as we start to grow and as these programs start to calcify, it's going to be more important to start to double click and understand the different you know, strengths that people bring to the team. Uh, I know on the business side, we've been kind of talking about this uh, for the last five to six months because you know, it's starting to get to the point where we need to think about it. Um, and we've looked at kind of a framework where you know, we have folks that are really good at the sales side, right? Acquiring trusted partners and borrowers. Um, so that's kind of a core competency that, you know, we, we have. We have other folks that are really good at strategy, right? And we, other, we have other folks that are really structured thinkers, right? So we're, we're starting to put those pieces together. 